I think we need to find that right balance with is how do we cater to these unique aspects of the design process, uh, these unique professions that all work together to achieve a unified outcome. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture. I'm your host, Ryan Willard. And today I'm honored to have the opportunity to converse with Roderick Bates, the esteemed Director of Corporate Development at Chaos. So throughout Roderick's distinguished career, he has been at the forefront of identifying and nurturing innovative solutions to architectural challenges. In his pivotal role at Chaos, he is tasked with the critical responsibility of monitoring industry and market trends that are influencing the methods employed by Chaos's clientele, both presently and in the future. His role involves engaging in strategic collaborations with technology partners, clients, and the leadership teams of Chaos's product development and research divisions to evaluate and initiate new product ventures that will pioneer future architectural design. Previously, during his tenure as a principal at Kieran Timberlake, Roderick spearheaded initiatives to develop and bring to market various software and hardware tools. These innovations have been instrumental in enhancing the environmental and operational efficiency of the buildings within the wider architecture, engineering, and construction community. And uh, it was a real delight speaking with Roderick. It's an absolutely fascinating career. Number one, the, the innovation of a practice like Kieran Timberlake, hiring and developing a research and development team and putting that kind of resource into innovation. And also Roderick's kind of um, visionary thought, his research mind, uh, and the kind of career arc that he's taken that now sees him at Chaos uh, and the kind of work that they're doing. And specifically, we focus on Enscape as one of the kind of key products and bits of software that Chaos is developing. In this episode, uh, we discuss how a blend of floristry and architecture led to groundbreaking approaches in sustainable design. We uncover the transformative power of software in visualization and influencing architectural projects. We look at the surprising ways non-architects are leveraging advanced design tools. And we also learn about the future of architectural software and its potential to revolutionize the industry. So a really fascinating conversation, very important. And uh, sit back and relax and enjoy Roderick Bates. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment, and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, please follow the link in the information. Roderick, welcome to the Business of Architecture. How are you? I'm doing wonderful. Thank you. It's, I think, the first day of winter, and it's one of my favorite seasons. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Yes, it's certainly certainly starting to get a little bit colder here. So, welcome. You have had a really fascinating uh, career. You were previously, before your current incarnation as Director of Corporate Development at Chaos, um, you were a principal at Kieran Timberlake. Um, you were there for about 13 years. Um, you were part of their research group, um, working on ec ecological, economic, social, and site-driven data to kind of create inf and inform sustainable design, which in itself is a very unique position, a uh, very interesting position in a practice, certainly in a practice of that caliber as well. And, um, and particularly at that time, I mean, it wasn't, something that really was on the radar of most firms um, thinking on that scale and uh, to be able to have the opportunity to come in and for them to see value in that uh, was, was, was unusual. Was that something that came out of your, your kind of university work or how did you end up positioning yourself in, in such a kind of unique kind of domain of expertise? Well, what, what and, happened? And, and, yeah. and, and what is this domain? What does it mean? Absolutely. Well, I, I first worked actually at Kieran Timberlake coming in from, um, between uh, my first and second year at forestry school. And there um, you get exposed to a lot of concepts within the realm of ecology. And one of them, um, maybe it sounds a little simplistic, but um, 
essentially one of the professors said, you know, listen, everything matters, but some things matter more than others. Um, and so when you're looking at an ecosystem, you had to figure out, oh, okay, what are all the inputs? But then what are the ones that really matter? And what are the ones you can manipulate? And so when I came to uh, Karen Timberlake, and I actually came by an introduction from one of my professors, an advisor I had, and he said, what do you, in, what do you want to do for your internship? And I said, you know, I'm really interested in the built environment and how we can manipulate the built environment to achieve ecological goals. You know, same way that within a forest ecosystem, you manipulate it to achieve a particular ecological outcome. And so he said, you know, I have a couple of firms that might be interested in this. So he put out his feelers and uh, Kieran Timberlake was one of them that said, well, that sounds interesting. Um, you know, we don't really exactly know, but yeah, why don't you, you bring them on over? Um, <clears throat> so I went down there and interviewed and I showed him some work that I had done that was um, you know, little hand drawings of like a, a sort of a nature experience that had a ecological component, an educational component, and folded into a larger development. And they thought, you know, this is pretty creative uh, for someone that's not even coming from architecture. Mm. Um, so they brought me on board for the summer, and it ended up being an incredible opportunity to work on one project by and large the whole time. It was a um, it was a university project up in Calgary, which for the firm was kind of like a, an opportunity to really punch above their weight for the first time, um, significantly so. And they really put a lot of effort into an interview process that was very unconventional. And a lot of it was around understanding the context of this project and what the opportunities were for this project to have a benefit to that larger context, whether it be the educational context, which is kind of obvious, right? Mm -hmm. um, but then also, you know, this is a place where um, the uh, the oil sands were, um, you know, one of the primary sources of funding for any project up there, um, university or otherwise. And so really understand the environmental implications there. Um, you know, what were the opportunities for a building to have an impact on that particular ecological outcome? Uh, what was the local ecology? What was the, um, the nature of the... Um, of the, of the wind throughout the year and how would that say be something that could be harnessed <clears throat> and ended up having this incredibly complex understanding of the site um, that I communicated to the larger firm and ended up being the basis for our interview um, showing how all of these myriad of influences would actually yield an architectural outcome and it ended up being something that was pretty unusual for the firm um, as far as an interview process and started to set a little bit of a template for how they approached site analysis and design going forward. Um, so given the success of that, they asked me to come back. And I thought, well, you know, that was a absolutely fantastic experience. Um, yeah. So yes, I'll come I mean, back. And so that's, that's absolutely fascinating. It's that's such an, that's so interesting that actually your, your, your initial area of expertise is in forestry and ecological systems. Um, and that's very progressive for an architect to, yeah, to take, to kind of engage with that. And actually you can start to see how, in a way, it's so obvious. It's such an, it's such an important thing. Yeah, it's sort of obvious thing. now, right? But that was a long time ago. Um, and it wasn't then. And, but it's, while it maybe obvious, it's also really dependent upon a firm with an open mind. And that's perhaps what I enjoyed most about there. Maybe I didn't realize how special it was at the time. But if you could come to, a, say, an internal design review or a crit or what have you with a compelling argument, um, some data, strong visuals that you could communicate, people would listen. Mm -hmm. And it didn't matter if you were like me. I was an intern. Or, you know, you were a design principal or a partner. Um, you know, everyone's voice mattered. And as long as you were effective in your communication and, you know, had sort of sound reasoning and argument. And, I mean, to me, that was really satisfying. Because in most places, particularly with architecture, you, know, you got the cape and cane and all that, you know, you, you have sort of an ego element, right? And that really wasn't the case there, uh, which I thoroughly enjoyed. Well, so, that, so that's a very kind of uh, interesting perspective as well that you must have because you've come from a, a slightly outside discipline to architecture, worked very intimately inside an architect practice with architects as a principal for a long period of time, um, but not been a, necessarily a building designer. Um, yeah, I, could, I could play an architect, right? Um, you know, for certain <laughs> aspects of it, um, you know, and, and, 
there's some things that I did where I was like, okay, this really started to drive design, like, you know, some very simplistic CFD analysis that actually informed the shape of buildings based upon my understanding of um, wind patterns in this mm -hmm. particular location throughout the day and throughout the year. And it actually influenced the design and then get to see that it actually worked. You know, there's things like that. We're like, oh, wow, that was satisfying. Mm -hmm. um, but you're right. You know, I'm not specifying things on a really detailed level and things like that. But I'm still playing within that realm in ways that were actually pretty informative. Um, mm -hmm. In that first internship, one of the things I also was involved on, it was a, a school called Sidwell Friends School down in Washington, D.C. And I think it was the first LEED Platinum K-12 through school. It was just wrapping up construction. <clears throat> and there was a desire to like let people know how special this school was. So there was a lot of um, components there, like a, a little... Um, constructed wetland that was processing wastewater and things like that. And so they had a, a, a visual about what was happening as far as that wastewater that was right there front and center. So to understand this whole wastewater system, they're like, well, here are the specifications. And they're like, you know, gave me some files to go through and had to read this. And then from there, kind of like back understand the specifications for the system and then create a diagram. Um, so all of a sudden, okay, I learned architectural specifications and things like that. So it was a really great way of learning a lot of the things that architects maybe mm -hmm. take for granted um, and allowed me to have a better understanding. But I do remember it was a long process. I, mean, I remember going to an interview and somehow I said something like, oh, there's a cement truck or something like that. And they're like, oh, no, no, that's concrete young man um you know things like that where like i still got really chastised on terminology and and whatnot which i really appreciated um because it was all part of that learning process amazing and, and so how did your role then evolve at, at timberlake and what was the what was the kind of group that you were leading and pioneering that okay so i certainly wasn't leading it <clears throat> maybe for a short period of time so when i did that internship, there was an individual by the name of Kevin Pratt, the late Kevin Pratt, who was really a, a polymath and um, sort of a, had a degree of intellectual latitude that was really, really exceptional. I mean, he was a remarkable individual. Um, and so I worked with him during that first summer, and he was sort of the, the um, uh, research director. And then uh, when I came back, he actually left um, to take a, um, a teaching assignment. I can't remember exactly where it was. I might have been Cornell or something like that. Um, so it was just me. Um, so there was a year there where I was kind of like, I was the research group and it was really a lot of fun because, you know, there wasn't necessarily a lot of second guessing of my assertions, which is always satisfying. Um, <laughs> but at the same time, you know, you got to do what you want and what you saw was important and, and guide things in a certain way. <clears throat> but obviously I was, I was pretty green. So they brought in a research director by the name of Miss Billy Faircloth um, from uh, UT Austin. And she was fantastic. And so the two of us, work together to map out what were the capabilities we wanted, uh, what was the the type of skill sets that were going to be required to hit those capabilities. And I remember we had printouts of every person in the office and their relative skill sets and things like that, trying to map out this whole concept of, okay, there's certain problems we want to solve. What's the team that we need to have to solve it? What's the team that we have right now? And what are these skill sets we, we can pull in? Mm -hmm. So working together, we ended up having the, an entire research vision that went everything from like a very structured component because we were an ISO certified firm. So everything had, you know, we had to have a research process that was documented and formulaic. Um, but within that, of course, there's a lot of latitude. And then we had to build out the team. And I have to say, there's nothing better than getting to build out your own team. Yeah. Um, you know, it's really satisfying because you get to find people that you know you're going to be able to work well with, um, but also going to push you um, and push the practice. Um, and, uh, you know, what do the people say? Like, you know, B people hire A people or no, what is it? A people hire A plus people or something. I don't know. All I know is that the people I hired were definitely smarter um, and they really got us to deliver. Um, but it was also a really fun interview process and bring finding these people um, was really an exceptional process. And honestly, the interview process was probably the most fun I've ever had at any firm I've ever worked at. And I've always tried to pick elements of it to, to apply it, going forward. Was it 
primarily architects or were you bringing in people from other disciplines as part of this research group? We were pretty open-minded um, as far as who we brought in. You know, there was a certain amount of bias on who would apply or even see um, the opportunities sure. here, you know, because we were oftentimes trying to kind of pull in people from adjacent fields, but, you know, what's a mechanical engineer going to even be looking for a job at an architecture firm? Um, so we ended up with some architects, but to call them architects would really be shortchanging um, these people. You know, there's someone that has like a, had a background in anthropology, but also architecture and forestry. Someone that had, uh, was it like Russian linguistics, chemical physics and architecture, um, oh. you know, things like that. I mean, it was like, you know, these people were all over the place. Um, but uh, I think that was part of what made it work really well is you had this exceptional group of people that performed at a really high level. Um, of course, they were all kind of alpha people. Mm -hmm. um, so I think probably to hang out with us was probably no fun for an outsider, <laughs> but uh, we all got along really well. <laughs> love it, love it. So that's that. I mean, I mean, as a from a business perspective, that's a very that's actually quite a unique um, position to be in is to have like an architecture firm to have a, this research group that's that's doing. I'm assuming a lot of independent research and then research which is then specifically geared towards particular projects it was yeah we, we had sort of these two pathways that we pursued uh, by and large um, and it was all funded by the work that the firm did so you mm. know there's a certain element of, of commitment and sacrifice there it was like a, it was like basically they were committed that like 10 percent of the firm staff was within the context of this research group and you know, we weren't doing bathroom details i mean this was research um, and so that group had really two different avenues that it pursued. One of them was that research that was in support of current design practices or current mm -hmm. design projects. Um, and then in addition to that, we had what I would put it more into the category of really blue sky stuff, like way out there, some of the stuff. Like I remember flying out to a company out in California that was doing uh, printed solar voltaics, organic um, photovoltaics, where you actually print it on like a sheet of plastic, like a roll to roll printing. And, you know, working with them on a uh, research grant with the Department of Energy, I mean, really, like, I don't know, it was way out there, particularly at the time. Um, so we got to do stuff like that and, and really think well outside the box. Um, and same deal as, as I was saying in these design reviews, you know, if you can make a compelling argument, put together a good research proposal with a budget and mm -hmm. an application and all this kind of stuff, um, it was a go. Um, so there was a lot of things that we were doing that was way ahead of the time, you know, deploying uh, custom building sensor networks um, to allow for these extreme high density um, temperature and humidity sensor networks. And we'd be going down to buildings that we were going to renovate and drilling holes in the wall, um, trying to hide them so that the architect in charge wouldn't find them, um, you know, <laughs> things like that. And then using that to create these really complex models that could predict uh, performance like you know, one project, I remember we ended up actually working with a client, bringing in, it was an un, um, unrestored building, and we put in all these sensors throughout the whole building. And what we wanted to do was figure out essentially what was the, the, uh, the thermal inertia of this building as an input to refine the energy modeling from a, a passive perspective. So we put in all these sensors throughout the building, in the wall, everywhere. And then we brought in all of these heating elements. Um, and blasted this building with heat for about 24 hours in the middle of winter and then turned everything off and then measured how long it took for everything to cool back down. And then from that, we were able to create this really nice dynamic model for how heat transfers through the building envelope and then coupled that with um, some uh, thermography scans that we were doing that's simultaneously that's and stuff like that's that. That's extraordinary because... I mean, one of the, the big sort of uh, missings in a lot of architecture practice is the fact is is the ability to be able to go and actually record and measure how well your building is performing, like yeah, your built right. work. Cause, yeah, cause and then, and also, what was your starting point, right? It's yeah. like, well, this is where it is now. Well, this is where we began. And now we actually could do that, right? Because, you know, we didn't want to take the sensors out of the wall. So, you know, it was something where you could go back and actually measure and say, okay, this is how big the improvement was. Mm. Um, and we actually had a really neat project up at Yale <clears throat> where we did that on a building. So that Yale University has an obscene amount of building stock, as you can mm -hmm. imagine, right? It's a big university. You add in the research component and the, the medical component, it's huge. Um, and so they were saying, well, listen, if we just 
improve the efficiency of some of this building stock? Like, well, then what are we doing as far as reducing our carbon emissions and things like that? Um, so there we got a project where it was actually, we're able to do an in situ AB comparison where we did the same thing. We put all these sensors both in the room, um, we put them in the wall, and then we actually got one of the rooms and we furred it out and actually insulated this historic building with a certain amount of insulation and things like that. Um, and then we ran a series of basically just tests, like through not through any kind of active measurement, but just kind of passive tests, recording how people felt. Um, and then recording the, the temperature and then also the set point on the thermostat because people can manually control the thermostat to make this argument for, well, should we be renovating these older buildings or not? Um, ended up being a really interesting data set, uh, mostly showing that you can't just renovate the, the wall assembly. You have to undo the whole mechanical system because these old systems with these boilers that were just raging in the basement, you overheated the buildings. So that was kind of the technique so mm -hmm. much that you couldn't just insulate. Um, you had to redo everything because right. the, otherwise the building just became too hot. Wow. Wow. Which is I, kind I, of disappointing. Yeah. Um, but, but, but so kind of critical to, to know. Um, it is. Uh, yeah. Right. You don't want to spend millions or tens of millions or even more than that. Um, and then figure, oh, well, maybe I shouldn't have done that. This, this is such an interesting area of kind of post occupancy analysis and actually being able to collect real data from built work or current existing buildings that a lot of architects end up only ever speculating speculating about um i know but, that's the kind of the bummer right and every time you go back like there hasn't there wasn't a single time in that whole experience where we went back to a project and perform any type of sustainability focused analysis whether it be bird strikes or um embodied carbon or you know energy consumption or something like that and found out ooh, like you know this needs a little extra work um you know nothing was nothing was the way it should have been mm -hmm. um, it didn't mean that we couldn't get it there but it did require some level of intervention um and um i think for us that was like a really important lesson but it was also one where we found that Oftentimes it was happening on a sort of a one-to-one -one scale. Like it was this project, this lesson learned. Okay, done deal. And I remember one of the, the firm founders, uh, Steve Kieran, was presenting on a talk at um, University of Pennsylvania called like the End of Oil. And essentially he wanted to make an argument that we as a as an industry actually have very little influence industry in that case being architecture. So I did an analysis looking at all the projects that were built every year um, and how many of those, uh, what percentage of that did that reflect of the t overall total building stock? This is in the United States. And then how many of those had an architect or an engineer involved? And the sad reality was that I think at the time it was like 127 million buildings or something was in existent. You know, you had a, limited number of those, you know, maybe 10% sort of exchanged every year of new buildings. Mm -hmm. And then you had this like tiny sliver. And I mean, it was like this huge diagram of buildings representing each one's like a million. And then like one little part of a house was architects involved. And you realized, holy cow, if we're going to solve this problem, you know, this, this isn't going to be a solution coming from yeah. one building at a time. Like we need to think bigger. And that thinking led us to take some of the lessons we learned, package them into software products or, you know, some sort of technology products that we could get out into the larger industry. And uh, from my perspective, that was probably one of like, from a sort of a paradigm shift, one of the, the most impressive things that that firm did is it really tried to not just hold this as this sort of reserve of of their knowledge that would be a competitive advantage, but really try to get it out to the larger industry. Wow. Okay. So, so the, the research that you guys were doing, you were developing tools, unique pieces of software and, and ways of um, manipulating, understanding, collating, presenting data, which then starts to manifest itself as new bits of software, which you can then release to the rest of the industry to, to have more of a bigger influence, which then yeah. leads us on nicely. I'm, I'm imagining now of, of the bridge that happens between Timberlake and your current position. Yeah, absolutely. Is, and that is in many ways the bridge. Um, so we had 
some software that ended up being actually relatively successful um, mm -hmm. in this realm. It was one that was called Tally. It was around quantifying the embodied environmental impacts of materials as you were specifying them on a particular project. It was a Revit integration and it ended up being one of the first tools for this type of analysis. And it was one that was born out of an experience. There was actually an EPA had a, a project where it was called the Design for Disassembly as a competition. So I did a virtual disassembly of one of our first projects that was done in Revit. It was a house down in um, Delmarva Peninsula. And wonderful house, absolutely beautiful, um, but it had a ton of spray foam insulation. Um, and it also had one side of the house that opened up with these garage doors to face the ocean. And when I did an, um, an analysis of the um, embodied environmental impacts, at that time, the data was pretty thin on the ground. So we could only do carbon and it was I mean, we were, it was some some serious bodging here to get this analysis. I was like weighing things. I was like weighing buckets of bolts and whatnot. And, you know, I tried to understand how much how much components were, and we found that this spray foam insulation was more than half of the overall body carbon, so to speak, for this house. Wow, which is huge, especially given that the house like half of it opened up. So it's like how important was this insulation that was like half the impact. Um, and so we were the thinking out of that was like, wow, I wish we really had a tool that could understand this at the time um, when we were making this decision. And so that led to the development of this um, thinking that we needed to have something that was integrated into Revit as you made decisions and specify materials, you could quantify that impact. Then we ended up getting a commission for the new London embassy um, for the U.S. government. And part of our proposal was that we would quantify the embodied environmental impacts of this building, which is all well and good. You can do it by weighing things when you're working on a small house, but when all of a sudden you're working on an embassy, which is huge, you know, this building was like a million square feet or something. It was massive. Um, that's not going to fly. And so all of a sudden it was like the dog that caught the car. You're like, oh crap, you know, what am I going to do? <laughs> and so that really jump-started the development of a process. And so we ended up coming up with a, um, an idea reaching out with Autodesk, which almost reached out to us at the same time to work together. And then with them, we found a technology partner in Germany called PE International, which I think is now Sphera. And we worked together to essentially create this tool for this project that also had applicability to anyone that had this problem. It ended up being really successful. Um, when you think about the first sort of product commercialization process, you want to figure out like how many people even knew about this. And remember sending a survey out to everyone in the, in the firm contact list, which was pretty big. And we got these survey results back and it was like less than 10% even knew what we were talking about when we said mm -hmm. life cycle analysis or body carbon. I mean, it was like nobody knew. And then, you know, I think if you were to do the same survey now in the profession, right, it would be like, okay, um, you know, almost everyone understands. Um, but to get to where I am now, though, a little bit of the challenge was that it's still an architecture firm, right? Yeah. You know, we're still in the service of, of architecture, and architecture was essentially the engine that was enabling this type of, of ancillary work. And there came a point where, you Essentially, I wanted to focus more on that aspect of mm -hmm. how do we get from that little sliver to the much larger um, paradigm of, of improving performance and really move the needle in a meaningful way. And you do that by essentially um, getting in front of as many designers as possible. And the one great thing is that Enscape was a software that was in front of a lot of architects and even mm -hmm. more today. And so I saw this as sort of a potential Trojan horse, if you will, <laughs> um, you know, to, to get in front of, of that really broad audience um, in a way that would allow for them to understand not only how something looks, um, but also how it performs. And I saw that being able to have those pieces of information together at the same time would really empower pretty sophisticated design thinking um, and design decision making in a way that currently wasn't possible, um, at least from my perspective. So, so kind of you, you're starting to recognize here in your in your career that you developed this very powerful piece of kind of a, a way of a, an analyzing data. There's a limit because Kieran Timberlake, they're still an architecture practice, as you're yeah. saying. They're not a software company, and this might not be something that they want to necessarily go through the whole 
you know, developing a piece of SaaS, a software for a mass market is its own, that's its own business. It's its own beast. I mean, I can just tell you, like I was doing you know, sales and support and things like that for that tally software. And it was like every day, four hours of just answering emails, you know, sending out invoices, dealing with the accountants. I mean, it was, you know, and, and, and that's taken away from really what helps develop those things in the first place, which is architecture. Yeah. And did that piece of, what happened to that piece of software in the end? So one of the last things I did before I left here in Timberlake was help facilitate the transfer of that software to the Carbon Leadership Forum, mm -hmm. um, which is our, the CLF, not the CLF, sorry, um, the, um, oh God, what was it called now? Sorry. Now I'm going to probably insult some people. Um, it was called the um, EC3. Right. Um, and so it's a embodied carbon database um, that had some pretty hefty funders like Microsoft and things like that. Um, and they were really taking the charge, um, had great funding, great staffing, um, and a really good position to be good stewards of that tool. Um, so they were the ones that, and we also had a really good relationship with them. Um, so essentially we facilitated the transfer to them with the long-term objective um, that it would really align with their nonprofit vision, right? You know, sort mm -hmm. of a greater accessibility of the software. Um, and so that's that's where it is right now. And I think they've been able to take it and adapt the technology to other purposes as well. Because um, the idea that it took a very accurate material takeoff from Revit, um, as you can imagine, has a lot of utility. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So you, you, you then your career started to move into, you know, you, you kind of recognize actually being or working with a software company actually is going to give you a bigger platform in a to, to be able to further these ideas and empower architects. It and was, and, and I honestly wanted to kind of enjoy this next transition period. You know, I, I really liked working at Kieran Timberlake, so it wasn't like I felt like I needed to, to, to see the door. Um, sure. But I also didn't want to be in a place where my aspirations were pushing the company um, or were butting up against what was best for the company. Absolutely. Um, so I took my time. Um, I to find a next position, I reached out to you know, all the contacts I knew that were kind of dialed in and whatnot um, and said, you know, do you see some different opportunities? And there were a lot of different ones that, that actually showed up, you know, whether it be working as a, um, a sustainability director or research director at architecture firms, um, a couple of different software options, um, some startups. Um, and then there was this one. And um, I ended up being introduced um, through a, um, a mutual colleague, actually. Interestingly enough, I got him a job um, at another firm. <laughs> and uh, so I had reached out to him, you know, sort of a little quid pro quo. And he introduced me to the then CEO of Enscape, uh, Mr. Christian Lang. And I ended up having an interview with him um, where I came prepared uh, with a presentation, kind of showing my vision of what I thought this product could do. And he's like, wow, this is great. Um, and I ended up having a really good rapport with him. Um, and so a lot of ways, um, I, I went there not only because there seemed to be receptivity um, to my thinking mm -hmm. about how something that is very strong in, in a visual sense could also be used to communicate performance, um, but also because of this individual. Um, you know, he seemed like someone that really had a great leadership capability, someone that I really wanted to work with. Um, and then really the other piece was Enscape's reputation. Uh, at Karen Timberlake, we had a, a technology evaluation group that would look at new software. And I remember Enscape came in on a Friday. They had done the evaluation. They showed it to the office during this little sort of you know, thing where you have some beers and you kind of you know, look at the new tech. And by like a week or two weeks later, every design team in the whole firm was using Enscape. Wow. Um, so like I knew like, okay, this, this, they got something special here. You know, this is, this is like the, the iPhone or something. I mean, it just took off. Um, so to me, it seemed like a really nice confluence of, um, individual firm mission and receptivity to what I wanted to do. Well, en Enscape has been one of these, one of these bits of software where there was a sudden sort of improvement in so many people's, you know, output in terms of their visualization. And I remember practices saying like, how did you how did you do that Are you where, who, who who's doing these images for you and it's like oh wait, we're using we're using this bit, we're using this endscape so um you you moved over and kind of started to work at, at, at chaos um can you just give us a bit of an, a, a context of the of the bits of software that chaos is involved in and then perhaps we can talk a little bit more about specifically endscape 
Absolutely. So I started out actually at Enscape before it was uh, merged with Chaos. Right. And I was the 100th employee, so it's kind of easy to remember. And how it ended up happening with Chaos um, becoming the, this larger company was that um, Enscape was realizing that we want we have a lot of opportunity here, but there, there's a limit to what our customers are able to do. You know, they want to go to that next level of quality. And we knew a lot of them were using something called the V-Ray software, which was made by a company called Chaos, to be able to achieve that next level quality, you know, that picture perfect stuff, photo real, so to speak. Uh, whereas we were really the reserve of real time and ease of use and things like that. So we were used for interviews and things like that, but we weren't like, you know, SOM wasn't necessarily using us for that, mm -hmm. you know, I don't know, billion dollar project movie or something like that. So we were looking at options for that next level quality. And interestingly enough, unbeknownst to us at the same time, Chaos was seeing Enscape as a threat and was developing sort of an Enscape killer, um, so to speak. And that would um, take a little bit of our lunch. And there ended, ended up being some investors that were kind of talking to both of these companies and saw this strategic opportunity saying, wait a second, you know, what about bringing these two entities together? Um, and making the company that could really be the visualization company uh, in the world. And so that's ended up what happened. It ended up being this this merger between Enscape and Chaos to bring together this continuous workflow of, of, of real time to photo real. And uh, in, from my perspective, you know, it made total sense. Um, and I think from the the perspective of where the industry is going, it absolutely makes sense as well. So when you think about the ecosystem of, of products that we have, you have Enscape, which is, um, it's really about ease of use at a most fundamental level. Um, and part of that is real time. Um, you know, it's, it's really quick. So you can make a design decision um, very quickly. So you can look at options, you know, it's like a, a curtain wall versus storefront, things like that. And it's so easy to use and so fast from a just a pure technical perspective. And it sits right in the platform you're using for the design process mm -hmm. that you can actually compare these options and things like that. Um, it's also that ease of use means that anyone can use it in your firm. Like a lot of firms that I talk to, it's like kind of a second window. So they'll have Revit on one side of their big screen and then they'll have Enscape running on the other. So it allows for them to get a more intuitive visual understanding understanding than you might get through a Revit interface. And then that same visual, intuitive visual understanding has a lot of, of weight when it comes to other audiences. You know, you show a client um, certain, like I say, a section drawing and like, I don't know, I know from experience, there's a lot of things that I probably at Kieran Timberlake, we show clients like either they really knew their architecture or they were just nodding. Um, and I suspect a lot of times they were probably just nodding because some of these things are really complicated to communicate um, via a, a 2D drawing and, and particularly one that's like line drawings and things like that. Whereas Enscape cuts right through that. And it's like, you know, anyone can understand well, this. I, cause, I, I think that's very, that's very interesting is, is as architects, we can, um, you know, you can be looking at a series of drawings for weeks and weeks and weeks. And, you know, you're, you train your eye to be able to read them very quickly. And, you know, even for me, I'm, you know, spent the best part of 20 years looking at architectural drawings. If I come across a heavy set of construction documentation drawings that are heavily labeled or I'll, you know, it's going to take me a little while to understand what on earth is actually going on. So God knows what it's like for a client who's, you know, trying to understand, uh, um, and particularly sections are, are, are a bit more, because they're, they're such a kind of interesting architectural abstraction. A section oh, is, yeah. I mean, right? No one's seen a building in section unless there's been a disaster or something it, like that. Yeah, ex exactly. It's such a, it's, it kind of really takes a little something to understand what it is that you're looking at, and no. it can leave a lot of clients a little bit baffled. So, and that's part of what I always felt um, in in all of these processes is there's a, a real need for inclusion. You know, people talk about the mm -hmm. importance of inclusion, and I always had a slightly different lens on it, which was everyone and the design process has something to bring to the table. Um, you know, there was always a, a mildly derisive term that people would use, like, oh, you know, don't let the client play architect or something like that. And I was like, no. I mean, they're paying a lot of money for this experience. Like they should enjoy this design process. Let them play architect. Um, similarly with various stakeholders. Like I think a lot of people have something to bring to the table that you're not going to think of. Um, 
And so that's why one of the things I really like about Enscape is it brings everyone potentially into the design process. You don't have to be just that expert that's looked at the drawings all this time and really understands plan and section like nobody else. Mm -hmm. You can be anyone um, and you see this and you can have informed decisions because you really don't necessarily know where the good ideas are going to come from. You know, they, they may come from the client group. They may come from those eventual building occupants. So for me, I had a very open mind. And that's one of the things I really liked about Enscape mm -hmm. um, is it kind of broke down that expert wall and, and allowed everyone to be participants in the design process. What, what were some of the other issues that you feel that architects were dealing with or other designers are dealing with that um, Enscape starts to open up and provide a, a kind of new set of solutions to? Well, I think one of the, you know, if I think of where Enscape is today, um, I think part of it is just getting work. If you were to think of like sort of the, the challenges of that. And um, I would say like what it takes to get a project now, it just keeps, seems, to, I, I remember when I left practice, boy, it was getting competitive out there. I mean, I remember working on, um, you know, this isn't like a top tier college. It was a good college, but it was like, you know, not exceptional. Um, and there was a library project and we were competing against Snowheda. And I was like, Snowheda doing this project? I mean, what's going on? Like competition is fierce. And if you go into a, uh, an interview process like that, you know, anything less than prepared, like you're really underwhelmed. And so that's one of the things where I think about what Enscape is, is enabling now. It's enabling people that don't necessarily have visual experts and things like that to create really compelling um, proposals for winning the work. Because obviously, if you don't win it in the first place, you know, you're not going to get the job. The other thing that I was starting to see is that a lot of interview processes were getting longer and longer, and there was mm -hmm. an expectation there would almost be like an element of design that was rolled into these interview processes. It was like the clients were almost trying to get something for free. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and so having something that allowed for a really rapid visualization as part of that early ideation made it a lot cheaper because you're not getting fee for this mm -hmm. process, but you have to present something. Otherwise, you're not getting the job in the first place. So Enscape seemed like a really good tool and is a really good tool for people to go through that sort of unfunded early design process that now seems to be required um, to win projects, particularly in interior design, I'd say even more so than architecture. Um, so that's a big part of, of some of the value that I think it, it really brings to the architects. Um, and then something else that's unique that I find, you know, beyond just you know, the pure visualization that Enscape enables is, is virtual reality. Mm -hmm. And virtual reality is a little bit like there's a bit of a schism, I would say, in, in our customers. You know, some people are like totally sold on VR and other people are like, I wouldn't touch it with a 10 foot pole and I'm going to get conjunctivitis. But for those that, <laughs> that use it, um, or motion it's sickness. A, yeah, or motion sickness, probably the more benign thing I'd say, right? I was a little worried about seeing these uh, goggles being passed around. Um, but as one of our uh, customer advisory board members said, you know, he feels or felt that the age of uh, shareable wearables is coming to an end. Like everyone, people are actually bringing their own VR goggles to, to reviews and whatnot, which I think is a nice idea. Um, but one of the things that VR does bring that I think is really powerful, particularly for those that don't have a huge reservoir of experience in design, is a sense of space. And looking at a drawing set and understanding a volume or how one room flows to the next is incredibly challenging unless mm -hmm. you have a lot of experience um, in architecture and architectural design. Um, and but you put on VR goggles and all of a sudden you can understand volumes. You can understand if that floor to ceiling height is appropriate or maybe too much. Um, you can understand what it's like to actually move and navigate. And that's something where you will just never get it from a traditional 2D drawing. Um, you know, it's like you kind of, it's like a little bit of a surprise. It's like, well, that, that worked. Um, whereas I think in a lot of ways, VR allows for for people to understand what is i think in some ways the most one of the most complex aspects of of, of architecture mm -hmm. um, like i say it's that that sense of space um and volume and scale which is very difficult to communicate it's interesting actually how how does the software evolve itself with and, and like it, it, you know just kind of going back to what you were talking about at kieran timberlake where you were running an uh, you know you were part of a research group and you were looking at those sorts of independently driven ideas and then developing software. How does Enscape develop and evolve itself? What kind of interaction do you have with 
with architects and designers that that kind of have you create innovations in the software? No, I mean, one of them, it is absolutely customer driven, um, but it's also mediated customer driven. It's kind of like, you know, it's not a Greek democracy, um, yeah. you know, it's more of a representative democracy. Um, so one of the things that, that we do is we absolutely listen to customers. You know, we have a public facing product board where people can actually vote and, and input their opinion. And then what we do is we actually look at the company that that person represents, you know, and so there's always a financial aspect that's, that's balanced with it too. Um, and then also, are they kind of industry leaders? Like, are there, are there requests ones that maybe indicate what's going to come next? Because some firms we know are going to be the early adopters and what they do, like something that Foster and Partners does, mm-hmm. there's a good chance that, you know, your rank and file firm will be doing that in five or six years, uh, maybe not today. So if we're thinking ahead, you know, who they are it really matters. Um, but the other thing is um, your customer advisory boards. Um, that's something that's part of my purview is managing our customer advisory board um, for AEC, media entertainment, things like that. And getting a group of individuals together that have the experience both as practitioners and are maybe now thinking more strategically, getting them together, challenging them with ideas, giving them assignments in some cases where they present back to us as a collective, hearing them discuss uh, the challenges that they're facing collectively, and providing a forum for them to talk in a way that's private, um, that they really don't get anywhere else, interestingly enough, is an incredibly valuable resource for us to say, okay, these are the challenges that they're seeing today. This is what they anticipate tomorrow. Um, so that's a really good one. And then we also have a power user group. It's a little bit more about brass tacks. You know, it's like more, a little more feature focused and things like mm-hmm. that. Um, but then also we have, particularly through our sales team, um, really good connections with a ton of different architecture firms um, and engineering firms, contractors of all different sizes, from, from the largest to you know, relatively small. And something that I like to do is, is actually reach out to those firms and understand their workflows, their challenges and things like that. You know, do an interview process, create reports out of that that are disseminated internally. Um, and then, of course, you know, you have support tickets and things like that. But all this information comes in. And then from that, we also have to look at just larger trends. So part of what I, I do in my group is look at just trends within the industry and actually put out monthly reports internally um, that also get sort of a a redacted version, if you will, goes out Mm -hmm. to resellers and partners and things like that. But I look at all these different pieces and and we really, as a, a product management team, looks at them as well. And from there, we kind of divine what we need to do because everything's going to be a compromise. Right. Um, and, you know, you're going to make some people unhappy. Um, some features aren't going to be there. I know, for instance, uh, Revit filter, support for Revit filters um, in Enscape is something where we have some people being like, just for the love of God, just do it. Um, <laughs> I, w- I would buy 100 licenses. And then, you know, on the flip side, we're saying, yeah, but we really need to focus on our our licensing uh, procedures here because license compliance is a huge problem for a global right. software company, right? So you have to balance all of these competing interests. Um, and there's always going to be more um, that you want to do. But that's a big part of it is that you know, we have to take in these inputs and, mm-hmm. and make compromises, um, fundamentally speaking. I think that's one of the hardest things saying, okay, you know, what, what do you sacrifice? And a lot of times it's things that I, I really felt were important, um, but I also have to take a step back and look at the bigger picture. Sure, sure. You, you, were, you were saying earlier as well about um, your, your interest in, in kind of having pieces of software that, weren't, that, that have the capacity to both visualize and anticipate the performance of the building. Does mm-hmm. Enscape um, have that kind of capacity at the moment? It, it doesn't have the capacity at this moment, at least in a, a public facing way. Um, mm-hmm. You know, we have some really rudimentary things and maybe look at lighting um, sort of intensity and or light intensity and things like that. But um, that's absolutely an area that uh, we'll be playing in and we'll be playing in in a way that really aligns with our, our core functionality, you know, mm-hmm. prioritizing ease of use. Um, but also maintaining a high level quality. Uh, and in order to do that, we're leveraging our skill set, um, you know, which is visualization and visual communication, but in conjunction with a technology partner um, that has a, a really strong presence um, from a quality perspective in this industry. Um, and this is something that we, we've sort of shown in limited um, to a limited degree, usually to solicit feedback and things like that. Um, but we'll be rolling out as a product next year. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and so for me, um, yeah, needless to say, this is something that I'm really excited about because essentially what we'll be doing is the same thing we did for visualization in architecture, which is democratization. We democratize visualization. We took it from the reserve of the visual expert, visualization expert, and made it accessible to everyone in the design process. And we're going to be doing the same thing in the context of building performance, uh, making this something that where you can not only tell how something looks and compare options from an aesthetic perspective, but also understand the implications from a performance perspective at a level of quality um, that you can really trust. And uh, I remember people that we were talking to for feedback about this concept, they say, you know, the first thing that's going to happen when I show this to a client is they're going to ask, is this accurate? Um, You know, is this how the building is going to perform? And they said, I'm not going to show it to any client unless I can say yes. Um, And so when we think about our mandate, um, you know, it has ease of use, has to have that quality of outcome, and it really has to yield something that's actionable. You know, right. where your render, that visually intuitive interface is the place where you can see the relative performance of your building from an environmental perspective. That is um, extraordinary. So, yeah. uh, that's an ex- extraordinary vision for, and, you know, to, to, you know, to kind of imagine software being able to be that kind of predictive of how buildings are performing tied in with like, you know, I mean, just how the visualization um, has evolved over the last few years where now we've got pieces of software like Enscape where you can be making these decisions very quickly and you're not just getting a mock-up, you're getting near photorealistic, almost imperceptible, is that real, is that not real, of what something will will look like in you know, in real time with decisions. Yeah, and, and, that. and that's part of the challenge, right? You're seeing this thing where the quality has gone up so much. I mean, it's like you look at an Ikea catalog and you're like, well, those are some wonderful photographs of all these little apartments. Like, oh, those aren't photographs. That's V-Ray. Um, you know, it's like, you know where this is going. Um, and so from our perspective, you know, we can't just kind of wait till we get to that quality cliff and say, okay, um, you know, all of a sudden now that quality is accessible outside of, of our software. Uh, we need to start to adapt and say, mm-hmm. okay, what's the, what are these other critical workflows that are out there that we need to, to adapt and, and include in our software with that same level of accessibility? Um, so that's absolutely where our mindset is thinking in the context of Enscape. You know, what are these critical design workflows? And there is no shortage of them. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, some of them are even going the opposite direction where it's like, listen, I love Enscape. I love that photo reel. But, hey, you know, let me tell you, um, Schematic design is no place for photo real. How do I walk this image back? You know, how do I make it more artistic, more interpretive, so the client doesn't focus on the detail, but instead focuses on well, the big design moves? That, that's, that's also very interesting. I was, I was going to ask, um, you know, what, what are some of the limitations around being so photorealistic? Because, you know, th- there's, there's something almost where we are. We're now living in a world where it is, it's, it's even for the best trained eye, I struggle and other people, other architects who are looking at these images all the time, it's difficult to tell the difference between reality and, and virtual reality or yeah. the difference between reality and, and, a, and a visual image. Is that a constraint in any kind of way for, for clients? I think it is because there's an element of, of art and science and architecture, right? And photo real certainly has an element of both. Mm -hmm. Um, to some degree, but also you lose a little bit of the emotion um, in some ways. And you get an, you have an emotional response to space um, when you walk into a fantastic piece of architecture, but sometimes photo real visualizations aren't as effective actually at communicating that emotion. Um, And you need to have something that's a bit more artistic, frankly. Um, You know, I remember talking with Herzog Namiron um, about their practice from a visualization perspective. And they're like, oh yeah, we have a bunch of visual artists that work on different projects. But which one you choose kind of depends on on what you want to communicate. You know, sometimes you want to communicate something that's a little dark and moody. Sometimes you want something that's really light and airy. Sometimes you want something that's very tectonic. And different artists have different emotions that they apply to their visualizations from their their perspective. And we recognize the same thing with our customers as well, This, except they just may not have the, the resources or capacity to do that. So one of the things that we're, we're doing, and we actually showed at uh, recently at Autodesk University with some nascent AI tools that we've developed. And that's one of the places where we think AI could actually be really powerful, is to bring that type of um, artistic visualization mm-hmm. into our drawings. 
And I think what's really exciting about this that I've never seen anywhere else is that we can do that in real time. So that means that you can, in a set of VR goggles, walk through something that is like an oil painting. That's your building. I mean, like, that's Whoa. out there. You know, that like something like that. You know, this isn't just like a, you know, a mid-journey button press. Um, you know, this is an immersive real-time experience that's artistic, um, which is pretty incredible, right? You know, that's so far removed from photo real and, and anything you can experience right now. Mm -hmm. um, it's pretty exceptional. That's extraordinary. That's absolutely extraordinary. Do you find that actually Enscape is finding its way into the hands of non-designers or or kind of professionals that you wouldn't have necessarily expected to be using oh, yeah. it and now using it? For sure. Like one of my favorite users um, that we have, it's actually an artist that does these uh, sort of um, cyberpunk Tokyo night scenes, you know, from like 2045, like these really futuristic things. I love it because it's art, um, but yeah. they're using Enscape. And from my perspective, you know, that I remember in, when I used to work here in Timberlake, people would take our uh, tally software and they would use it in ways I had never seen before. You know, they would like create dynamo scripts and manipulate things and find the best, best outcome. Um, and things like that, where I was like, wow, they're really kind of hacking our software. And I was like, that's how, you know, you've made it. Um, when people take your tools and use it in ways you never expected. And Enscape has that. We have people that use our software in ways that I never would have expected. Um, and these artists being a really great example where they're, communicating things truly artistically um, mm -hmm. via our software that's well outside of the traditional realm of architecture. You know, it's art. Well, and, and and this is where you get the, the real interesting kind of feedback loop where you've got unexpected users using it in a completely new way and then a new a new feature begins to evolve or develop, which then everybody starts to, to use and becomes quite fundamental. It's true. Um, I think that maybe this artistic mode will be uh, one of those ones or, um, you know, the, the capacity for, say, um, PBR material generation, sort of on command, um, things like that. I think I have a lot of opportunity there. But uh, on the flip side, um, I think what we also are faced with is a challenge is that as you get into more of these critical workflows, you know, building performance being an example of that, you also start to cater towards maybe a distinct branch of the art of the design process. You know, these mm -hmm. are different disciplines for a reason, um, whether it be interior design, landscape, architecture, what have you. And that's one of the pieces that, that I think we need to find that right balance with is how do we cater to these unique aspects of the design process, uh, these unique professions that all work together to uh, to achieve a unified outcome. And I think that's one of the things that makes this industry so exciting is that you really do have these diverse teams, incredibly diverse teams, um, and yet they all work together to deliver one building. And so similarly, our software is going to have to reflect that diversity when it comes to capabilities, but also you know, allow for that unified um, design experience. Amazing. I think that's the perfect place to conclude the conversation. Roderick, that has been absolutely fascinating and wonderful speaking with you so i really appreciate oh, your, it was my pleasure your, your, your time this morning because you've given me a really really deep and unique insight into into both the, your you know your own career and the kind of fundamentals of of Enscape. so thank you absolutely my pleasure and that's a wrap and don't forget if you want to access your free training to learn how to structure your firm or practice for freedom fulfillment and profit please visit smartpracticemethod.com or if you'd like to speak to one of our advisors directly follow the link in the information the views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and i make no representation promise guarantee pledge warranty contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.